And now we're going to move to a panel of, uh, if you will, reactors. Um, so I have the honor of introducing and moderating this panel. And the purpose of the panel is to react to Bill's thoughts from this morning and to share with you their thoughts from very different perspectives on what the future, you know, from non-librarian perspectives and what the future of our libraries will be or the libraries of the future. You can turn that either way and it means slightly different things. Um, so anyway, the, if, you're, if you um, are not expecting to be in perspectives on the library of the future, planning, design, and innovation, then you should leave now. So you're making sure you're in the right place, all 140 of you, good. So today we're going to hear from an architect, a campus planner, an ethnographer, a healthcare administrator, and a faculty member. And I will introduce all the panelists to begin. They'll come up in their order, as you see it in the program. Their full bio sketches are in the program and online. So in the interest of giving you as much access to them as possible at the end of all their presentations so you can ask questions, I'm going to really shorten their bio sketches. I will tell you more than their name, but you know, it's going to be a little bit more less than that, a little bit more than that, rather. So we will have time for questions at the end, and I'll give you instructions about the questions when that, when that time comes. Um, and so our five panelists today are Peter Bullock, who's an architect, who is a principal at Holzheimer, Bullock, and Meehan Architects. Lisa Keith, who is, raise your hand, Lisa, she's two down there, is a principal at the architecture firm of Ayer St. Gross, with a specialization in academic space planning. Our ethnographer, Nancy Fried Foster, is Senior Anthropologist for Libraries and Scholarly Communication at Ithaca SNR. And Dr. Barbara Barnes joins us from the University of Pittsburgh, where she's Associate Vice Chancellor for Continuing Education and Industry Relationships. Additionally, she's the Vice President of Sponsored Programs, Research Support, and Continuing Medical Education for the University of Pittsburgh's Medical Center. And finally, Dr. Stephen Harine, Professor of Medicine and Vice Dean for Undergraduate Medical Education, at the Sidney Kimmel Medical College is from right here in Philadelphia, Thomas Jefferson University. So please join me in welcoming our panelists and we'll get started. Good morning, thank you MJ. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today and, and very happy to be a part of this program. I'm actually learning quite a bit and um, I was fascinated by Dr. Marlin, Marlin's um, topic this morning, his ideas on thinking differently in terms of clinical teaching and where things are headed in the future and the plausible future aspects of, of what we all do. Uh, as an architect, I'm going to focus more on the physical space and, and thinking differently in the physical space, um, embracing dynamic change and the benefits of flexible space. So the Today's topics, I think, are, are very exciting to me. I think I mentioned to someone that uh, the depth of understanding of the medical profession is so deep that sometimes I feel very intimidated by that. But what we have done in our practice is developed a, a way to really think differently at the beginning of a project to understand each and every institution's uh, environment in a way that, that makes it very specific to the end result. Um, when we think about a building program, setting out to change a building to new ways of doing things, uh, one of the things we've shifted to doing is creating a process that we call mind-breaking. And we call it mind-breaking because one of the biggest hurdles we find in development of new space to meet future needs is the very difficult nature of people to hold on to what they know or what they knew and very hard for them to envision what could be in the future. And so attached to the, the physical or the plausible uh, kind of options that are facing us, uh, we do this mind-breaking exercise. We get everybody involved in the project, all the stakeholders, and in a lot of cases it can be a very large crowd. But what we do is we share with them a series of slides and photographs of things happening all across the country, internationally, uh, in the health science library, or in the academic realm in, in the physical space of the library. And in that process, people are exposed to different things, things that are happening now, things that are advancing, like the uh, Google Glasses or the Google Cardboard things, things that are here and now that are the future uh, indicators of where we need to be. 
we ask everybody to participate in this collaborative kind of process by writing down what they like and what they don't like about what they see. And, and hopefully this really resonates particularly with uh, the client we're working with. So during that process, all of the ideas come to the surface about maybe what people like. It identifies some of the things that are vestiges of the past that people are holding on to. And it also promotes a, a thinking of, of new things, of future ideas and how to transform the physical space. As I mentioned, it's a very collaborative approach to the design and planning of, of the physical space. Uh, much like a lot of the uh, teaching that's happening today in the medical library, the health science library, it's very collaborative. We move then on from the mind-breaking process into a process we call building-breaking. A lot of times we're dealing with buildings that are existing buildings and facilities that were designed for a specific purpose 20, 30, 40, 50, or even more years down uh, in the past. And how do we think about that building differently? So we call it mind-breaking because or building breaking. We want people to try to remove the barriers of what they currently know about that physical space and try to envision it differently to meet the new uh, types of ideas. So in this process, in a collaborative uh, way with our clients, uh, we're working very creatively to map out what those spaces are. And as you're, some may be familiar with bubble diagrams when you first define spaces and lay out spaces, uh, we're actually working with our clients firsthand to do this. We're not doing this kind of in a vacuum. And then that gets re refined into uh, a little bit more recognized plan. This happens to be for the Hershey Medical Center, uh, their transformation. And uh, it ultimately ends up in a, a, a space plan that really shows how the new space will function, where everything might be and how it might work. And this process really does promote dramatic change. Uh, the things that we also like to try to uh, instill is to think a little bit about what we want to do for uh, the faculty, the staff, and the students in the Health Science Library. And instead of a space, we focus on a few uh, key terms like experience, empower, innovate, and involve. And those key elements, I think, are the things that we need to think about when we look towards the future. And the physical space is then built around supporting those ideas. So building spaces that are flexible, that have uh, ability to create, uh, are sustainable, that can change over time. And the collaboration idea, uh, really how do you bring everybody together to, to work together to uh, advance the, the cause? And as we may know, uh, a lot of the libraries, the health science libraries we work with, um, were built in eras in the past, and they were designed for the print material. So what you have and what you find in these spaces are just rows and rows of shelving. Uh, print journals, bound print journals, textbooks. Uh, there is no real uh, collaborative space. There's no comfortable space. There's no space to come to work together with peers or uh, in industry leaders in uh, the research that you're doing. In Houston Academy of Medicine, the Texas Medical Center, this is the uh, first floor plan that exists as we began work with them. And as you can see, it's really populated with nothing more than just uh, a shelf after shelf of, of material. So in this process of working collaboratively in the mind breaking and the building breaking, we're developing a dynamic new space that involves 24 seven student access space, involves the display and uh, uh, kind of access to the history of medicine, uh, to learn from the past, as Dr. Mallon mentioned, um, looking at some of those archives and, and artifacts. Uh, and then the, the space that used to be all of the shelving is a wide open collaborative space for social gathering and learning. In the street level here, we're developing uh, everything from small individual uh, study rooms to small group study rooms to larger classroom spaces. And these are all spaces that can take and transform the, the, the thinking from uh, the print knowledge base to the digital knowledge base and working collaboratively with, uh, with institutions of learning. A lot of the buildings, as I mentioned, were designed for the book or the, uh, the print material. And so they were book boxes and didn't have a whole lot of people space. In this particular case in the Houston Academy of Medicine, 
we're actually cutting a hole through the floor so that we open it up more so that the spaces flow uh, and link from one to the other. So the upper, upper floor here, which is more of the collaborative space, flows down into an area that is the classroom, the small group study space. But to not lose the, uh, the footprint, which is valuable footprint of, of space uh, for program use, we're doing these in creative and new ways where uh, there's actually a impromptu open air classroom that can be uh, uh, done in this particular area so that students can engage with other students or faculty or, or uh, uh, librarians in the pursuit of understanding of, of research and the things that they're working on. So when we think about the new physical space, I want to share some uh, complete, uh, completed projects for the Southern Illinois University Health Science Center. I mentioned the 24-7 access uh, to, uh, to the library, uh, spaces that are very flexible with furnishings that can be moved around, um, place for gathering to work with your peers and your colleagues uh, at different events and different uh, programs. Collaborative learning, promoting the ability to share ideas, um, having spaces within the library that are in the open area where there's writable surfaces, writable glass, or just the furnishings that are put into these spaces where you have some semi-private area where a couple of people can work on something together. Or the collaborative learning that extends into more just social gathering or breaks between uh, study and research and areas that you really want to spend time in the library to, to be with your, your peers as you uh, embark in your research. These spaces, though, also for collaborative learning are, are very, very flexible. I mentioned the, uh, the writable surfaces again. The things in the, in the library need to be adaptable to change. So uh, for small groups that come together to focus on discussions, you have spaces like this or spaces like this where there's a variation of types of furniture, uh, seating, um, also modular elements that can be broken down and moved around uh, to promote a collaborative kind of learning environment. But also the individual uh, study carols, uh, we're doing those in a, a much more uh, comfortable and invi an inviting ergonomic way, uh, lots of use of natural light so that we're opening the space up so it's a comfortable environment to work. Uh, spaces that have small group study with uh, spaces where people can uh, come together and meet maybe between programs and so forth and uh, the laptop bar areas to uh, come in and, and gather uh, digital information or print material for uh, something that they're working on. These uh, small group study rooms are being built out of demountable walls, so these glass partitions are very flexible so that they can be changed over time. So as libraries evolve and, and the space needs, needs change a little bit, these walls can be moved very easily uh, and reconfigured to, uh, to new uh, in, um, kind of configurations. And then the classrooms I mentioned that, that we're incorporating into um, to library, health science library spaces are flexible as well. So these classrooms are not your traditional classrooms with rows of seating but seating that is uh, structured this way for more of a lecture type environment, but also can be broken down into small group, still semi-lecture-like environment. Uh, you notice the high use of technology and access to, to information. This is another example of just breaking down that classroom space. So uh, we have everything from collaborative open space uh, to uh, individual study space to small group and to large group classroom space. And then the idea of uh, the technology, the high intensity technology that's being developed today, uh, the one button studios like at Penn State uh, where students can actually create the content very easily that they're working on. And, and you know, when you talk about the virtual reality, the Google Cardboard, the, the device, the cardboard device and the iPhone that you use for that is relatively inexpensive, but to create that virtual reality model that people are working with, students need to have access to high-end technology so that they can create the product that they're working on and researching, and a, and a library is a great place to be that, that hub of technology. And of course, the 3D printing and the idea of the digital sandbox um, where you're actually creating the content and you're providing the access to information as well as technology for, uh, for students to be able to have access to that to create that material. So 
in, in conclusion to this part of, of the physical uh, introduction of, of change in space, I wanted to mention a few key elements. One, uh, space for people to collaborate and work together. I think that uh, it's a very important notion to have a space where people can still socially come together to work in a collaborative way uh, to advance the thinking of, of a particular subject. And uh, two, the shift from the print-based uh, knowledge base to the digital knowledge base. Uh, as I mentioned in the prior slide of the, the library being designed in the past for the material, now it's being designed for the digital uh, access to technology, the digital content, and the social collaboration in, in, uh, in study and knowledge. And then how do we develop a new focus or a role for the center, uh, center as your, of your organization uh, for access and use of increasingly digital-based knowledge? So uh, for me today, this whole discussion about uh, the training of, of medical science with students that's evolving and, and changing rapidly uh, with the understanding of how the physical space can accommodate that change, I think they're very, very exciting uh, topics, and um, I will defer now to Lisa for her part and welcome any questions on the physical space in a moment. Good morning. I am not an architect. I am a space planner. I am the numbers person that helps or should help to bolster the needs that you have inside the library. And so part of what I want to talk about today is what are today's trends um, and as we heard from this morning, what are tomorrow's trends. Um, same data, new considerations, complementary functions that could be housed within the library, and then what's beyond the quantification of the amount of space that you need. So with today, we have shrinking collections. Um, that's not always the case with all institutions, but that's the direction that we are heading. The types of study venues that you have within the library are very vast. There, there used to be just you know some group study areas, open areas, the private um, study carol, but now we have so much more that we need to create within the library. The instructional spaces that need to be housed there um, very important, as well as maker spaces, and how does that play a role? Now, the role of the librarian and the staff has changed over time, so you become more of an informationist, but does that really dictate how much space you need, or is it more about where is your space located? The additional services that the library offers, and then all these other complementary functions that could be housed within the library. So starting with data, because I'm the data junkie, um, I still want to know about your physical collections. Not the digital ones, but the physical ones. What do we need to house? So one of the first questions when I start a master planning process or even a pre-design process is I need to see some, some data. And it starts with the collections. Where are you at? How fast are you culling your collections? How quickly are you converting to digital collections? Once we understand that, then we can start to break down how your collections are um, housed within the library. Are they in open stacks, closed stacks, um, compact shelving? Is that compact shelving open to students or is it enclosed so that the um, staff can only get to them? Those all have space implications. And I'm trying to put numbers around that, those, num uh, those collections. So, with study stations, I want to get down into what types of study carols, how private is private, and I think one of the things that um, Peter referred to was um, making sure everything is flexible. So do students have access to uh, rolling whiteboards? Can they write on the glass walls? Um, the study rooms, what about video conferencing spaces? Those become important within the library so we can do telemedicine. Um, open collaboration areas. Are, is the furniture such that, you know, students like to come into the library and they will rearrange the furniture, whatever their whim is for the day. Um, so if you try to keep everything organized and in rows, it's just not going to happen. The lounge seating, comfortable seating arrangements. The computerized stations. Um, how much are you, or how many computers do you have? Do you have open access computer labs? 
or are you an institution where all students are required to bring their own laptop? And do they have access to power? I keep waiting for um, wireless electricity. We keep telling, we, <laughs> we're being told it's on the horizon, but it's not here yet. So are there enough electrical outlets around? Um, and then these maker spaces, are they open or are they enclosed and how do students access them? And so when I'm interviewing and talking to you, the librarians, I want to hear your thoughts about how do you think your space should be arranged and how much of these types of spaces should you have? And it starts with what percent of the total student body do you want to have in your um, library? And once we understand that ratio that you're trying to get to, then we can start breaking those study stations down into square footages per seat because they all require different amounts of space. Oops. So, some of the complementary functions. Everybody wants a cafe, and sometimes that's possible, sometimes it's not. Ex exhibit space. So, one of the things that's popular is to have art exhibits within the library. Do you have allocated space for that? Are you just using the wall space? Museums. Um, it's amazing to me how many health sciences have collections of things they want to display and where do those reside? Do you need a separate space for that or can it be in, an, in a glass case? The other key thing is interprofessional education space. Is, should that be located in the library? So I'm working with a couple of institutions right now where they're all about interprofessionalism but they don't know how to make it happen. So the library is a safe place. Nobody owns and controls it. They can all go there. Center for Teaching and Learning. When I think about the future and what we were presented with this morning, I see this becoming a really critical space, probably housed within the library, I would think, because if we're going to have all of this technology and virtual reality, who's going to write the curriculum for that? How is the curriculum going to be written? Then we have testing centers. How relevant are those? Do you need more? Can they be shared? Um, working with One Health Sciences campus right now where they all think they need their own unique testing center. Um, can it be shared? Informatics, that's a great hub to put near the library. Everybody needs data informatics. The Sim Lab, that's some spaces that we're seeing in some of the health sciences libraries and the standardized patient clinic. I never thought about it, but when you start to think about um, interprofessional education, could that be part of the library? And then finally, information technology. They're the people who make everything work. Do you have enough broadband? Um, about 15 years ago, I worked, did some work for a non-health sciences campus, and they told me, well, you need to have enough broadband to justify five devices per person on campus. And you thought, hmm, that's a lot. Well, guess what? We're there today. How many more devices are we going to be adding in the future? Or maybe we'll be collapsing some, but can you really count on that? So those are the different types of spaces and the complementary access to spaces you need to be thinking about. So when I'm done with my work, I develop a space needs. I show how much space you need. Um, one thing I want to go back to real quick is study space. You need to consider study space that's housed outside the library. Not all study space is inside the library. And we need to think about that in a holistic manner and how do the different programs access that. And who's responsible for it on campus? Sometimes that's space that gets really ignored, but it needs to be adequate, collaborative, informal spaces that may have some mediascape to it. So once we've quantified all of, the in, or all of the square footage that you need and we've started to tear down those um, preformed ideas about what the library is before it goes to Peter's group, how do you want your space to be arranged? Are you going to have a new, a new building which gives you a lot more flexibility or is it going to be in a renovated building? And start to think about the user experience as they come and enter the the library and what do they see first and the wayfinding and how do they move around the space. And that's it and I'm going to turn it over to Nancy. So nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, so 
what we're doing here, um, participating in this conference, is envis envisaging the future of health science libraries. And I think that this is a very worthy effort, and not just worthy, but necessary. Um, I've been working for more than a dozen years now as an anthropologist in the land of libraries, and I've been involved in projects to design new technologies and services and spaces to meet current information needs, but importantly, to anticipate future needs and build toward them, and that is to build toward the future rather than waiting for it to come, um, or rather than waiting for it to be better distributed. I like that William Gibson quote that Bill Mellon uh, put up on the screen. So um, the, doing this is, was not my idea. I work in a field participatory design that emerged years ago in Scandinavia in the 1960s. I was just lucky enough to um, get in on it. Um, I was recruited by Susan Gibbons, who's now at Yale. She used to be at Rochester, and David Lindahl, um, now at um, University of Missouri, Kansas City, to uh, work on some design projects at the uh, University of Rochester's River Campus Libraries. In our first project together, we implemented and customized a DSpace institutional repository using this participatory design approach and doing work practice study. So participatory design is a way of doing design, a way of designing things with very broad participation. So say you need a new building or a new space. You'll certainly have architects and designers, engineers and builders, they're traditional experts, they're indispensable. In a more participatory process, you include more experts. So you would include possibly the people who will work or live in the building, the ones who will have to take care of it. Their expertise has to do with what they will need to do in the building, how they will need to feel, um, how they will interact with others. Um, the more traditional experts, like architects and designers, can learn about the practices um, and needs of the people who will be in the building, the more they can learn about them, the better they can build a workable building. And this, in fact, is the process we followed when we worked with Air St. Gross on the Gleason Library. And the same is true of technology. We absolutely need traditional experts, software uh, architects and engineers and developers and designers to design and develop the software. And the more they know about the practices and needs of people who will employ the software, the better they can build it. Note that I'm showing you the, um, the minor library page in our institutional re repository. Um, and some of the really interesting collections behind that page. Um, traditional experts have clear roles in design. So the architect knows what to do. The space planner knows what to do. You've just gotten a really nice illustration of that. But um, just somebody who's going to use a space or a technology, they don't really know what to do in a design process. They need to be facilitated. Um, they need a way to contribute their knowledge so that it will be understandable and usable by the traditional experts. And this is where the various methods of participatory design come in. So we take a lot of approaches. We have a lot of methods for engaging lay experts in the design process. To me, they fall into sort of two broad categories. And the first um, includes uh, surveys and a variety of interviews. And I thought it would take just a moment to share some results with you. Some of you I know have seen these and already had horrible reactions. Um, <laughs> we'll just gloss over that. So, um, I <laughs> so across uh, questions in the survey on the transition um, from print to electronic resources, um, we saw that medical faculty members are generally more comfortable with this transition than people from other disciplines or, or areas, humanities, social sciences, sciences for both journals and monographs. So what that means is they're, they're there, they're ready, get rid of the paper, they're okay. Not everybody, but certainly much more okay than in these other areas. Um, and it seems to me that these survey results back up the combinatorial future report. And I'll, I'll discuss this more in a moment. Um, this, I think, is the really uneasy slide. Um, most medical faculty responding to the Ithaca SNR survey strongly agreed that locating and evaluating scholarly information were important skills for the undergraduates in their courses. That's a second from the top, but if you look at the bottom, they did not indicate strong agreement that librarians help students develop these research skills. 
I think that this relates to the decentralized model of education also from this combinatorial future report. Um, it suggests that someone had better help students develop these skills. I don't really know who's better than a librarian to do that. Um, so I think that there's a, a big mismatch here and probably um, an opportunity, but it might have to be approached in a different way from tr traditionally. Uh, direct questioning in a survey or an interview can get you a lot of information. I, I actually do more of something else. Um, sometimes you just, you just want to listen to people tell their own stories their own way. And I um, like to use photographs, drawings, and maps to help people tell their stories. This drawing was done by a student who participated in the design of the Gleason Library. That was the um, project we did with Air St. Gross at University of Rochester. And information provided in this way is very robust and very detailed, but it's also culturally coded. An anthropologist who's familiar with the context can crack the codes and help the traditional experts understand the underlying messages, which then serve as the informational basis for the design work. So in my own projects, I use these artifact-based interview methods to understand people's work practices and work needs in connection with finding, using, and sharing information. And, um, and the other basic way we gather information in a participatory design process is through a form of work practice study in which we actually make a video recording of someone at work and then view the video with them and get them to explain to us what they were doing and what they were thinking and what was easy and what was hard and where they got stuck and how they got around obstacles and what they would do if only they could make the work process better. Maybe they could wave a wand and suddenly they would be able to do what they really want to do and they would be supported by their tools and their spaces. And we capture that information. Um, so a participatory design process diversifies the expertise of the design team. It expands the informational basis for the design work and it increases the likelihood that whatever is built will help the community for whom it is built. But I think there's more to it than this. I think that the close study of what people actually do when they do their work, how they get stuck and unstuck, is the key not just to meeting their current needs and designing to their current practices, but also a way to detect new practices as they're beginning to emerge. And combined with careful study of the environment, such as we see in the combinatorial future report that I keep referring to, and actually I think maybe you're going to get it, but not everybody has read it yet. Um, it offers a way to anticipate future practices. Um, so what I'm saying is we have to look at technology and work practices together and in the context of health sciences libraries, we have to do this in a way that is empirically and theoretically informed about teaching and learning. And this is exactly what a group of librarians did in a study that applied the ethnographic methods developed at the University of Rochester in a clinical setting in six regional health science libraries in Illinois. And I think there might be one person here from University of Illinois, um, Chicago, who participated in the project? Maybe? Um, and I, I was the consultant on the project, so I worked with them pretty, pretty much all the way through. So they asked third-year medical students to map or log their movements for a day during which they did some <coughs> clinical work. And the following day, they used the map or the log as an aid to memory, asking students to tell the story of the day and prompting them in particular for information about finding, using, producing, and sharing information. They were interested in the whole day, catching up on email, Twitter, the weather forecast, checking up to date surreptitiously during rounds, um, mobile health, and Bill Mallon's talk. Um, following up on that inquiry that evening on more academic and authoritative resources, choosing a movie to watch that night, just the full gamut from uh, morning till night. And they found that speed, convenience, lack of a need to log in, and recommendations from trusted individuals, including peers, physicians, and even librarians, were some of the factors influencing their choice of information source and technology. Behaving like a doctor was also a factor, thus the quick glances at the phone while on rounds trying to evade notice by the real doctor in charge which I find particularly interesting because um, in the medical student's behavior, you see the emergence of on-demand learning, which is the number one force that Bill Mallon had on the screen this morning, I believe. But we also see that there's a conflict between this spur of the moment learning on the one hand and putting on the white coat on the other. 
Um, so in practice, there's a conflict there which could impede that force and impede the learning. The biggest barrier for the medical students was lack of wireless or mobile phone network coverage in some of the clinical settings. And I think this is no small point. Infrastructure is a major force with serious social consequences uh, for the future. And, it, and it's very, very, very unevenly distributed. The Combinatorial Future Report and our speaker, Bill Mallon, are looking out at the technological, pedagogical, and societal context to see what's coming down the road. And I'm suggesting that we combine this with fine-grained information about what real people are actually doing and how what they are doing is evolving or being disrupted. This is very different from traditional library design, which places the library in the center and asks questions from a library point of view, such as, how can we get people to use library resources? What I propose is that we ask instead, how are people using resources in their work? What resources are they using and where are they finding them and how are they going about acquiring them? We can then examine how the library currently fits into these organic processes and how its role may change for the better by addressing unmet needs. The difference may seem subtle, but the effects of taking the user-centered approach are great. For one thing, we avoid assumptions that may be faulty. For another, we get out of the box of past solutions, and I think that this latter point is very important as one of the great challenges of library design is to prepare and be flexible for an unknown future. By looking at the habits and needs of library constituents, that is, people who actually use resources and services that the library may provide, plus all kinds of technology, we can take the focus off things and put it on practices. Instead of asking what the things people need, I like to ask, what do they need to do? This supports the development of a set of action-oriented requirements that can be met variously through space, resource, service, or technology offerings. Design teams can use these requirements to develop innovative ideas and break free from past patterns and current gizmos and gadgets and move us into a workable future. Good morning. Good morning. So we're going to switch gears here a little bit and um, talk about the implication of new clinical delivery models. And I think we have to understand that academic medical centers are really at somewhat of a catharsis at this point in time. Understanding uh, if they need to uh, begin to differentiate the academic mission from the clinical mission. Um, and really move back to the more traditional view of the medical school, the health sciences schools, uh, and then some other unit out there that, that sees patients. Um, and I would like to present the perspective that this is really a missed opportunity for um, the university and the academic medical center, and particularly for the academic library. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my role, um, I often describe myself as a recovering physician. And <laughs> as I've moved into the dark side of administration and, and often get a, accused of uh, dis being disloyal. But um, I function at the interface between the, the University of uh, Pittsburgh and the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And I'm going to take a little bit of a, uh, uh, an opportunity to talk about some of our journey uh, in how we have tried to um, really put the library front and center in uh, some of these discussions. So most of my career was spent in the, uh, the legacy of the 20th century model of, of health care, where the academic center was really the pinnacle um, of the whole delivery system, and, and when, where the model of health care really revolved around the hospital. So even though um, physicians had offices, um, most physicians, you know, had a strong um, uh, affiliation and practice life within the hospital. Uh, and then the, you know, ultimate part of the care delivery system was the academic medical center. And really, the, if you think about the libraries, it represented the same kind of a model where, you know, when I had my private practice, I had a bookshelf and, you know, it was the pharmacology book and the internal medicine book and so forth that were probably 10 years out of date. Uh, and the standard journals that tended to stack up. Um, but virtually every community hospital had a library 
which was really very important to it. Um, and having various relationships with the, the Central Academic Library. Uh, for the most part, in at least a, a good portion of the 20th century, the community hospital library uh, was required by at least some accrediting bodies. It was primarily designed for physicians. And it was this physical place uh, where people did uh, access most of the resources, but it was also a place for socialization. When people spent half their day in the hospital, this was a great place to get together and just catch up with things. Um, librarians were present based on hospital size. Um, and you know, again, the formal relationships with academic libraries uh, were variable. Beginning in the 21st century, we've really seen a sea change in healthcare delivery based on the impact of the Affordable Care Act um, and really moving from a, um, a notion of volume, of seeing more patients, doing more things, doing more procedures, more surgeries, more invasive uh, catheterizations and so forth, uh, to the notion of value. How do you get the best quality for your money? This has put academic medical centers in quite a difficult situation as insurance companies have begun to tier networks and instead of sending all of their patients to an academic medical center, only sending the patients that really need to be in that environment and choosing to send the other patients to lower cost community-based settings. Looking at things like bundled payments where you get one fee for the whole continuum of care, like a joint replacement. Um, and really looking at quality measures and evidence-informed practice. Also looking at the impact of consumerism as people want convenience and are taking increased responsibility as they have increased copays and deductibles. Um, and resulting in very new delivery models, the formation of networks and interprofessional practice. Um, so this is kind of the volume value equation. Um, and you know, as, as a payer or a patient, um, really trying to take a look at the different sites of care, uh, where you get the best quality, and where you uh, pay the least amount of money. So if you would, um, you know, go into the, uh, this equation, you'd really like to go toward, toward the right and, and the bottom, uh, looking at the preference for outpatient sites, community hospitals, and again, academic hospitals, unless they are able to really compete, being in that left, le, uh, upper left-hand side on both quality and cost, as perhaps an environment that you might not prefer to send a patient to. So as we look at you know, this, uh, this new system, what we realize is that we're really flipping the model of, of healthcare delivery, and in a sense driving patients who don't necessarily need to be in an academic center out into these lower cost settings. Um, and instead of the bookshelf in the community settings, there's a computer. And it really raises the question is what is the role of the academic medical center library and the community hospital library? Um, we're now seeing much more heterogeneity in terms of how academic centers, medical centers look uh, with faculty, not just staying in the primary, tertiary, quaternary uh, hospitals run by the university, but actually functioning in multiple sites. Um, we're employing more non-faculty uh, physicians and distributing our trainees across the clinical uh, uh, system. So as we talk about education, huge impact on information resources. Uh, we're forming many partnerships with community providers and increased roles for non-physicians. So information resources are important to all health providers uh, in those locations who have a tremendously expanded scope of practice. Uh, we're seeing an increased focus on the care of populations and responsibility for the continuum of care. So no longer is it really acceptable for patients to move from one site of care to another without a, a tremendous amount of integration. Uh, in terms of coordination of care, but also cost effectiveness. Um, and then uh, diversification of activities, uh, including international operations, so it's not necessarily limit limited to our uh, geographic area. Uh, so as a result, this is really creating a differentiation between the university uh, and the clinical delivery systems. Um, I, I heard this term recently, which I thought was very good. Uh, as we form these different kinds of relationships, you'll hear a lot about mergers, acquisitions, affiliations. 
uh, really thinking of the anatomy and physiology of, uh, of these relationships. Uh, in, and within academic medical centers, uh, many times you'll see all of these arrangements, which can be what I've described as communities, which are loose affiliations, where you come together on certain activities, extended families, where you have you know, strong affiliations, but you might not have um, shared governance, um, siblings, uh, where you have a separate clinical academic unit, but they're under one sort of parent. Uh, and gee, that looks a lot like Barbara Epstein on the bottom. Right? <laughs> or a, a single individual where you under, are under the, uh, the same uh, legal entity. So I think the question here is, how can the academic library fit into these new organizational models? So I, I entitled uh, this talk, The Reality of the Virtual, because it doesn't seem in these very distributed networks that physical libraries are, are really going to be feasible in terms of scalability. So the real importance of the library uh, is to provide information and other resources to support efficient and effective delivery of care, uh, the mutual educational mission, uh, particularly when graduate education may not be under the aegis of the university, uh, and also uh, really to support academic pursuits and quality improvement, with the goal being the best information and resources at the right place at the right time. Um, and also realizing that it's not just the licensed resources, but also the informationists or information specialists. And when we think about this, this can be one of the key differentiators of an academic clinical delivery system versus many of the other uh, non-academic systems that, that are being developed. So I think the harsh reality here is how do we make the, how do we make the value proposition? So, Barbara and I have both been in this position, at the, at, in this table, um, of really uh, trying to, to let healthcare administrators know uh, why we need uh, these um, academic resources when so many things are freely available over the internet, the Google phenomenon. How much does it cost? Uh, is this a competitive strategic asset? And can we partner with someone other than the, library, uh, the academic library? Do they really understand our needs? And I think this is the position that a lot of you will be faced with as you look at how you integrate with these clinical delivery systems. So this is the, the system that, that Barbara and I uh, work in. This is the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Um, the large H's are teaching hospitals. The small H's are uh, non-teaching hospitals. And on the right is our uh, specialty hospital that we manage in, in Palermo, Italy. Uh, we are strongly affiliated but legally separate organizations since the 1990s. We've been at this for over 20 years. Uh, we are each other's primary affiliate. Uh, clinical faculty are employed by both institutions. Uh, Non-faculty are paid by UPMC. The information systems are separate for the, for, for the two in, uh, institutions. And uh, we have a very large network with over 20 hospitals, 400 outpatient sites, two and a half million covered lives. We're the largest private employer in Pennsylvania. We have 1,800 graduate medical trainees, and I mentioned our operation in uh, Palermo. Um, so this has been our journey. Um, we um, traditionally uh, had all of our electronic resources and reference services at UPMC provided through the Health Sciences Library. Um, and also each UPMC hospital had a library. Um, in 2009, uh, we had a little bit of a crisis. This was part of a cost savings initiative at UPMC. Uh, and I described this as potential divorce proceedings between the health system and the health sciences library. The compromise, which I think took a few years of, of our lives off of us, Barbara, and um, involved um, the library, the Health Sciences Library, providing a limited set of electronic resources throughout the health system, as well as information services to graduate trainees. Over time, we've reduced the number of hospital libraries uh, and using those hospital librarians in a more centralized fashion as a centralized resource. And we're really looking at this as a journey um, in terms of how we can more closely integrate with the Health Sciences Library uh, to really be the, the virtual uh, information resource uh, throughout the health system. 
Well, I think what we've learned um, is that we need uh, together to make a strong case for uh, academic libraries to be part of the strategic vision of the academic clinical delivery systems. We need to identify a very strong advocates in the delivery and academic enterprise to inform administration. That's a lot of the role that I play. I report to the senior vice chancellor on the university side and the chief medical officer and chief financial officer on the UPMC, to, on the UPMC side. And I think that's really critical to get people at high levels to inform these, uh, inform these decisions. Uh, we had a, an NLM IAMES grant back in the late 90s, and I think this was really instrumental in forging the relationships that we've had with the library to allow us to really um, articulate this vision. We also have had to spend a lot of time with publishers uh, to address licensing issues, to understand pricing and exactly what access will be uh, afforded throughout the health system. Um, and we need to continuously evaluate the models for delivery of information resources. So what I see as the artifacts from the future are re-envisioning the physical library, increasing the integration of information resources into care delivery, and I think some of these ideas were mentioned uh, in terms of increased integration with the electronic me uh, medical record, um, and really more of a push model with algorithms that uh, really identify the resources and push them to the clinicians as needed. Uh, and also the virtual information as services that support clinicians throughout the uh, system. I think the major nonlinear factor here is the speed of change. Um, these relationships are happening really at warp speed and it's very difficult to keep abreast of them and to really maintain and advocate, advocate for the value proposition. So I think it's in, in, uh, extremely important uh, that all of you find partnerships, engage in the strategic uh, discussions, really articulate the value uh, proposition, and really all work together to truly support this vision of what an academic delivery system should be. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody for their attention. Thanks for the invitation, and uh, what a great turnout, and a very a jointy crowd. And usually they say, well, we're gonna make a group, everybody's, oh, you guys were like, didn't even let Bill finish his statement, so that's, that's a good sign. Um, and I also wanted to, how many librarians in the, in the group? You know, can I tell you, usually I'm like addressing sort of geeky curricular stuff or talking about viral hepatitis, good time to talk about that clinically, of course. But to talk to a room of librarians, you know, what a privilege. I thank you from the halls of Miller School, from the hallowed, uh, stacks of Mud Library at Oberlin College, from, from the Scott Memorial Library at Jefferson Medical College, where I've spent endless hours uh, under the tutelage and care of people like you. So thank you for doing what you do, and what a great privilege for me to be able to talk a bit about how academic medical libraries affect medical education and vice versa. This is my home court. There are representatives from the very fine Scott Memorial Library here in the room and the Center for Teaching and Learning and the relationship between our library and our medical college is a close one. Uh, our medical library has been remarkably flexible in changing its space, uh, what it delivers and its services in the setting of um, uh, what can be termed financial challenges uh, and making the much, much of uh, limited resources and so I'm very grateful for that. This is how we used to teach. You know, so I'm a clinician. I'm, I'm not yet recovering. I'm still <laughs> diseased. Um, and we, we, this doesn't look terribly different than how we teach now. There's the board guy up at the top, and people falling asleep, few people pretending to take notes. Um, but, but what it looks like more is like this. Now, this is not from Jefferson, although I will say that the amount of people that are attending this lecture is very similar to what we're seeing. These halls were built for large groups, in fact, we were required by the LCME, I just said the four-letter word, I'm, you were required by the LCME to have a, as many seats as there are student butts, uh, but that model is changing, as is the haberdashery, and I would also hesitate to say uh, the coiffure of our students uh, <laughs> over the time of previous, previous classes. So what have, what's being done? There's new spaces being delivered. We're asking for new spaces. The medical college is not alone in asking for new spaces. The nursing school wants new spaces. Everyone wants to do active learning. We're required to provide active learning. Uh, and so these spaces are being developed. We want flexible space. We want 
tables that are round. We want access. We want enough bandwidth. We want screen. I mean, I don't know about these screens, I don't, but but these are just areas that we're asking for. So the library, I think, has been very involved in providing not space planners as well, uh, our classroom as well, but the library is certainly involved in these requests. This is an actual action shot from just several weeks ago where we're doing, uh, we're like many medical colleges, estimated 85% of medical college either just have, are about to, or in the process of major curricular overhauls. We're in that group. We're kicking off our new uh, curriculum, which we've named Jeff MD, uh, in the fall of 2017, which is just around the corner. Uh, so we're trying on a lot of techniques to size. We have over a thousand medical students at Sydney Kimmel Medical College, about 265 per year, uh, and so developing the ability to give small groups to do PBL, to perform team-based learning, to have narrative feedback are all challenges, and those are uh, things that I think the academic libraries can help us with. So we, this is just a big cafeteria space with a bunch of collapsible tables and chairs, and the students all have, we give them iPads, but they, I don't know what they use them for. They all bring their laptops in, uh, and, they, and we give them an assignment, and they've gathered. So I think the message I'm trying to give here is it's not so much the facilities. Sure, we want shiny new spaces and, you know, sort of Euro cafes, and we want all that, but we can do this in, in settings which, if, if we're flexible, it's about the technique, it's about the pedagogical design, it's about empowering the faculty, it's about engaging the students, uh, and although the physical space can certainly help. These are, again, random shots of my smiling students uh, performing a, what is a, um, what we're calling an active learning session at Jefferson. I'm starting to have trouble with my homework, says Sally. Well, sometimes you just have to open a book and go right at it. And she says, I hate opening the book. <laughs> I, I like books. And I think that this is, this is I don't know if anybody recognizes this, this, this is the library of, um, in Salamanca, Spain. Uh, and I think these spaces are glorious. And so the idea of um, sanitizing our spaces into um, uh, stackless, um, uh, recycled seating, uh, emporia of, of conferences, I think would be a loss. And I think that there are, t there's a time and a place for books uh, and for journals and for spaces that are surrounded by some of the trappings of education as it has existed in the past. So that's my appeal. I, I like books, but that doesn't mean that we, we can't be going forward. So in this assignment, you saw the students performing in a moment ago at those tables. Uh, the, the assignment was the following. We went over some cases, uh, some active learning. They had to, in their group, they had to come up. They had to make a presentation, PowerPoint. We're all using PowerPoint, so why not have them use PowerPoint? And they had to make a, and they had a template, and they had to fill it out, so they had their conference, and they worked together in groups, and they made this presentation. And then they also had to, as part of a slightly different exercise, create a one-page document. They actually had to write a document of a learning objective that came up during the session, and they were going to look into that learning objectives, and they were going to provide an active learning exercise and provide this essay. Now, as a, self of pen, as a form of penance, I read them all myself, because I'm asking the students to do this, because we're sort of trying on these new curricular designs. So like 270 essays, and they were of variable quality. So let me say that the, the, most, so let me say that the most common resource that was used was this, up to date. Now, I don't have anything against up to date, but at least when I was going to school, you wouldn't like put the World Book Encyclopedia as your first reference. In fact, most people that use this resource, which was immediately recognizable for how it was written, didn't even mention any resources they used, which to me was a shocking, now I should know better, but it was a shocking revelation of the state of scholarship on students that are coming, and, and they come from very different backgrounds. Um, there's another source they use, and some of them, have, this is just the entrance under medical library, I thought you'd enjoy that. Uh, but again, one that I, I find should not be a primary reference for investigative work of our students. So the, I guess the point I'm making here is, as the librarians, as the hallowed, uh, the, the hallowed profession of which you're members, this is something, that, and this was mentioned, this is something you can offer and that we need to use you to offer to our students. What is it when you're asked to come up with an original idea 
How do you find a source? How do you cite a source? How do you synthesize the information? How do you write cogently in English using grammar and punctuation? <laughs> the, have you seen this tool? This is, this, is a, this is from a tool. So the students, we need to learn from our students. They're doing stuff. And like it or not, they're doing stuff. And so we need to understand how they learn and what their models are. This is from a, a product called Sketchy Micro. I'm not employed by Sketchy Micro. And there's many such items. And this, this is what they use to learn basic science, OK? So all these little things have codes, OK? So for instance, because they're on a ship, there's something about being an intracellular organism. There's a mermaid there, so this particular bacterium or organism uses no muramic acid. It stains purple with gem sustain, so this treasure. Poor gram staining is the white sand beach. I'm not making this up. <laughs> this, 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 apparently this, uh, it looks like this um, mermaid has some inflammation. Uh, I was, I was, I, and there, she also was wearing the seashell bra, which is her pneumonia. Uh, this, this particular sailor has a swollen knee and the monkey has urethritis. I feel sadly for, yes. Now, the, this is a crow because it's a macro lie that used to treat this infection. I didn't make this up. And the flag is Ceph triaxone. There's three axes. Uh, it can cause blindness. Anybody know the answer? It's chlamydia. So, so what they do is for all their organisms, they have these things. And I've been given presentations by students saying, oh, we should, we should be using this as our primary method to learn the basic sciences. I resisted. <laughs> I'm going to switch gear for a moment. I'll be done. The, the other thing I want to talk about is, I mean, pedagogy is pedagogy. We've talked about a you know, universal curriculum, and that's probably achievable. And there's all kinds of ways to give information out. The hard part, I think, is to assess competence. And we're all, everybody knows you know, competency-based medical education. And the assessment of students is a difficult, difficult task. And as we build a curriculum, we realize that if we don't understand the assessment techniques and we don't develop assessment techniques, then we're no good, because that's what drives student behavior. So we believe there needs to be bedside or point of education direct observation. That means empowering my faculty, training my faculty, and paying my faculty to do assessment rather than pedagogical exercises or in addition to. And this is just one tool that we use and we want to develop more, but I think this is well within the hands of the library community is to help develop and implement these point of education feedback and assessment modules that can be done right at the point of contact. How, do we, how best to give formative feedback? It's not, oh, you're a seven, good job, come back and do it again. No, with this particular, with this particular interaction you had, the kind of counseling you gave was good, except you used a bit of jargon. That's valuable feedback. And if I do a dozens of assessments of that type over a course of time, I really get a meaningful picture of that student's, that student's accomplishments, as opposed to sort of a global halo effect. These are, this is just, again, we're learning from our students. These are actually presentations, where I, which I will not, in the, in the, in the, uh, because of time, show now. They're about a minute and a half each, and they're available. And I think all these presentations will be available to you, and you can click right on them. But these are from the AMA um, Advancing um, Clinical, the ACE Consortium. Uh, I, I should know, you should know that Dr. Frisbee is here somewhere. The Center for, uh, Center for Teaching Learning and I are co-PIs uh, in this consortium of the AMA. So we do believe in, in meeting education with the library services. The first presentation from a group of students in Vanderbilt talked about a common curriculum, sort of having a, a virtual um, a uh, cloud-based storage system of curricular elements rather than reinventing the wheel all the time, just as we talked about in our group. Uh, this, the second one, we were second place uh, at SKMC, is actually incorporating design thinking into actually learning medicine and providing um, the clinical skills and assessment. So I, I think there's so much we can learn from our students. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, are younger than I. Uh, but the bottom line is how these students interface with information, how they access information, how they process, how they report is, is in many ways different than how we were taught uh, and how we might uh, be able to think. Uh, so I think we need to listen to how they're going. Not that we have to use sketchy micro, but that we have to listen to how they're doing it and then and meet those needs rather than try to shoehorn them into the resources that we've already been using. So thank you and thank you for this wonderful panel and I really look forward to hearing everybody's questions. What a wealth of viewpoints and lots of food for thought. Now, it is my understanding that Barbara Epstein and 
Renee, are going to be running around Oprah-like. Oh, oh, Elena, sorry, you get out of it. Nice. Um, anyway, you're going to be running around, and so if you have a question, raise your hand. Make sure you use the microphone. Make sure you identify yourself, and if you have you want the question directed to a particular panelist, that's fine. If you want to just open it up to everybody, that's fine too. So, questions. Whoa, hi Mike. Uh, primarily for Peter, but Nancy or Lisa can chime in too. The two breaking exercises you talked about, how linked are those? So if you do any theme generation in the first session, does that inform the second session? And are the demographics of people that are actually participating in that the same? Does that make sense? Yes, actually. Hear me? Test, test, testing. Yeah, yep. Okay. Uh, very good question and, and good point. They are linked. Um, it's very important that the people that participate in the mind breaking process with the visual stimulation of, of what's happening all over the country and internationally uh, go on to the building breaking process so that they're informed about new things um, that are out there to contemplate and consider, and then uh, as you move into the, the actual uh, planning of the facility, you have that knowledge that, that you've brought from that first process. Uh, the constituency, it could be as broad. Uh, we have um, done smaller groups with focused individuals, could be students, could be faculty, could be uh, anyone, or it could be in very large groups, but the uh, ultimate objective is to uh, really capture as much difference of thought that you can base your beginning thinking on and then weed it down into the most practical, um, rational uh, solutions. First of all, thank, thank you. That was a great panel and mm -hmm. a lot of thought. Um, I'm in the midst of thinking about new four new buildings not for the library, but within which the library will be distributed, hopefully. But I fear that we're still thinking, even with all the pictures I've seen today, we're thinking today. So how can we think for those 10 years in the future of what we're gonna need and get all the stakeholders to participate in that thought process? Well, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, you know, I think that there was the statement made about the futures here and now, um, and I think that the advancement of the, the process that's put in place in the planning, uh, ultimately you have to design flexible buildings to, to continue to accommodate change down the road. Um, I think that the, uh, the real uh, push to look towards the future takes uh, innovative participation from um, the, the university or the teaching institution that, that we're working with. Uh, there's that old kind of force that everyone reckon, reckons with is that it's very difficult to get to pe people to think differently and even when you expose them to things that might be here and now and that are coming and the advancements are going to be dynamic people aren't really willing to make uh, a dynamic shift because it's it's untried or unknown and so I think the the philosophy is really just to encourage that discussion broaden people's perspectives and then ultimately design a very flexible space so that you know, some things you may try right now that are, are very progressive, maybe those don't work really well right now, so you shift back to a different kind of physical layout. Uh, but at some point in time, those things will come back around when more people get more comfortable with those ideas. So I think the two, two basic principles might be trying to get people to be more adventurous in in taking a, uh, a leap of faith uh, into the new and unknown, and then designing flexible space so that if they're not quite ready now, they will be as things get uh, tried. Any other comments from the panel, since that was general? Yeah, I'll jump in there. Okay, please. Um, I, I don't know, I'm still composing my oh. thoughts. <laughs> uh, it is very hard to get people to really um, to break away from current ideas. In fact, um, on a lot of these projects that I've worked on, we really had to spend a lot of time creating not just kind of a, a safe space, but but um, creating some kind of mental conditions where people could let go of of current ideas to be able to even think, you know, and maybe say, 
um, something that would be felt as really at odds with what the library is now. Um, the other thing is, well, um, I, I, I have some doubts about the way strategic planning is done now, and I think that what's needed is really to to find a way, again, it might have to be in a, you know, on a small scale, in a very safe space with people you trust. And a lot of work goes into creating that. Um, I think it, it's probably necessary to um, let go, e even for a moment in time, of everything that the library and the institution is right now and reimagine it completely. Just looking at what are people doing now, what are they trying to get done and how is, that going to look, you know, as well as we can tell over the next five to ten years, and and what does this institution offer, and what could the library do, and and even if it's just for a moment, put it together completely differently. Like if we never had a library, uh, you know, we were just starting from scratch, how would we do it? Um, and just have the courage to have that conversation, and I think that can be a starting point. Acting on it might be very difficult, but if you never have that conversation, I think you give up the game before you start. We have one over here, and then we'll go to Shelley. Peter showed us the um, floor plan of the original library with all the shelves. What I want to know is what you do with the books. Uh, good question. I think that um, the, the combination of things happened um, one is that the, the Houston Academy of Medicine does have an off-site storage facility that a lot of the uh, relevant material that was still accessed, but ra rather accessed infrequently, um, or maybe dwindling, was moved to. Also, a lot of the print journals, you know, there's the four regional uh, facilities that uh, require that, um, I believe it's two copies of every print journal ever um, created has to be re retained. and so. A lot of medical libraries um, or health science libraries are, are, you know, carrying multiple, multiple copies of these uh, journals that really aren't needed to be housed anymore. So the, um, the weeding of the, the, the collection uh, can either be dynamic or kind of in phases, maybe move to an off-site storage. A lot of institutions are developing uh, facilities to house that material that can be retrieved if needed. or um, or just shifting to the to the digital print collection. Um, one of the I think points I wanted to make in, in the idea of um, you know everyone liking the book or, or cherishing the book and the and the kind of the um, very uh, historic nature of of the library, we we are not getting rid of that completely. I mean, there's still a large historic research component that happens in facilities. Um, in the Houston Academy of Medicine, we just opened the McGovern Research Center, so. There's a large uh, collection of, of uh, print material that is accessible in a research environment um, specific to that, uh, that kind of research. But the day-to-day -day, uh, training of medical science or uh, students is really, we're finding that that's more digitally, um, uh, digital knowledge base. Uh, this is working. Okay. Um, my question is, as you started visualizing, visualizing the library as a multi-function space with testing and besides and different types of instruction, what do you see as the impact for the education of the librarian? As we, you know, as what, do, what other skills and a knowledge base do we need other than what we're currently provided with? I see you being a facilitator of the research endeavor, um, information specialist, and I don't see that just because you incorporate those other types of functions within the library that that is under the domain of the library, but I see you working collaboratively with those other areas, IT, people who are in charge of curriculum design. Um, I just see you being housed together working collaboratively more than it coming under the purview of the library. Uh, thank you. I, I would add um, that the, I mentioned briefly that the, uh, the, the assessment piece I think is gonna become huge. Yeah. 
uh, and the idea of understanding not only instructional design, but the nature and type and effectiveness of different methods of assessment, I think, is going to be a huge area of growth and would be a great space uh, for librarians. Um, my question is, uh, I definitely agree with the idea of fostering space for collaboration and, and having that sort of group gathering capability, but I also believe in preserving some sort of quiet for people that do want to be able to study and, and do that in a space where they're not having to compete with a lot of noise. But what have you found in terms of your surveys and interviews with um, users in terms of how important it is for them to have a place that's quiet in terms of balancing you know, these ideas of new, uh, using the space for new purposes, but also maybe still having a little bit of that traditional um, sense of the library? Uh, that's a good question, and, and that actually varies um, across the board in, in different areas, but there still is an interest in individual study and quiet study. Um, in fact, at uh, the uh, Hershey Medical Center, or Health Science Center, uh, the upper floor has still got, uh, I don't know how many can think of the number of individual study carols and is the, the real quiet, focused individual study space. Um, also, there are students that like to study individually in a quiet atmosphere, but also in a social, you know, knowing that there are peers doing the same or, um, so when you look to design the space, you're not only looking to design it in a flexible way for change, but you're also zoning the areas of the library to to accommodate a louder to quieter um, area in the, in the facility. Um, the thing that we think about as, as architects when we define the space is that no one, uh, not everyone does the same thing the same way. And so you have to design a space that is, someone can find their space. So there's a place for everyone in the library. And it really is based on, on zoning and how you lay out the program. So those quieter areas can really be quiet. Hi. Um, so as you were all uh, speaking, I was thinking about one of the common themes that I was hearing throughout is sort of this hub and smoke model, whether it's in academic health centers, in the educational process, even within the library, and yet many of the trends that Dr. Mallon was addressing this morning were more point-to-point -point interactions between individuals in the education process, and I wondered if you wanted to all speak to sort of the changes and trends and how that might dictate spaces or just general changes in education for us long term? Just maybe, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll start out with that. Um, I, you know, I think the, the inter, uh, individual interactions are, are very important, but it certainly needs to be within an institutional context in terms of the, the, the resources and aligning with the overall goals. And, uh, especially as we look at some of the, the concepts, you know, such as the, the flipped clinical setting and, and so forth, that, um, you know, I think that really has to be driven, although it's an interpersonal interaction, it really has to be driven through the institution. Um, and again, requires that sort of strategic vision and, and coordination in order to, to really make that scale. Hi, I'm Christina uh, from Upstate um, Medical University in Syracuse. And our library over the past oh, decade has engaged in a series of micro renovations um, in acknowledgement that the way people are using our space has been changing. And I don't know, perhaps some people uh, might get some affirmation here is our students find it very challenging um, not because of the space, because of the temperature of the space. Um, and as we've gone through these renovations, we've, you know, we've used fusion, everything you know, can be broken down and put someplace else. But the challenge that we face with these micro-renovations micro is the um, legacy structure of our building. So if we acknowledge that things are gonna change in the next year or 10, um, as architects, as space planners, um, what are you doing to design a building that works for my use today, but when I need to go and rip down my walls tomorrow, I am not going, going to have a freezer zone in one corner and a sauna in the other? And let's not even get into the water issues. 
Uh, there's one really great advancement if you're looking to renovate um, a building. Of course, that the, the micro renovations happen everywhere. We're doing those as well, and sometimes that's needed because sometimes the administration doesn't have the funding in place to do the full uh, renovation. But when you do, you know, pockets of renovation, then there's more of a, a re realized benefit to doing so, and it helps promote future, you know, bigger expansion. Uh, but you know, when you're when you're looking at a facility, you have to uh, consider the environment. I mean, it has to be a comfortable place for people to occupy, both aesthetically and and comfort from from you know temperature. Um, so you you know, a lot of the buildings that we're working in today have systems that are way beyond their their useful life. Um, you you need to improve your your physical plant first of all, but then how do you maintain changes over the course of time? Um, so uh, some people may be familiar with raised access floor systems, and these are systems that uh, on the one hand are important for just the power distribution. So you have a floating floor that if things change, you can pick up uh, electrical boxes and move them to different locations. You take that one step further and uh, have a higher raised access floor where all your um, uh, air distribution is run and the similar situation as the, the electrical outlet as the, the uh, facility changes, those duct um, uh, diffuser points can be moved to be reconfigured to the new space. Um, that is probably the most flexible and easiest way to accommodate those type of changes and if you can do that would be solving that problem completely. Um, it's a much harder issue when you're dealing with traditional distribution of air and you make changes in your building. Um, except that what we're seeing really now is that uh, libraries are becoming more open space. So from the onset, you're designing a, a distribution system that's probably, uh, it, it, its first design is, is um, designed to take the, the kind of the most extreme situation. So as you change and move things around, uh, the capability of that system can be modified to, um, to accept that new change. I think the biggest problem, though, is those micro renovations because a lot of times you, you don't have the resources to go in and improve the physical plant or to put in the controls that really uh, are needed to make sure you can change that environment. And I'll, I'll go back to my first statement is that you, you really have to, all of these things are very important. And I've, I've learned a lot today in just the discussion of the medical uh, teaching. but. Uh, they all play a, an important role. Uh, you can't instruct students in, in, in whatever the subject matter you're working on if they're um, not comfortable or they're distracted or it's an environment that they can't um, do what they want to do or, or uh, kind of get their thoughts out. So um, thinking about it in, in different ways and more uh, globally is, is very important. After listening to this, and I, I've been increasingly wondering about this, should, are we at the point where physical libraries should be designed really just for students? We don't see faculty. We don't see clinicians. We don't even see researchers. We see students. And that's a whole different way of thinking about it. So when you look at community hospitals or hospitals or any hospitals, do, is libraries just a thing of the past? And then if that's so, um, you know, and you just have a bunch of resources wandering around uh, on, available for people, how do you have a vision of these are educational resources with services? Actually, I'd like to speak to that. So first of all, um, I know that this is mainly a symposium about space design, but I, I um, I don't think that you can think about the library only as a space, and I, I suspect you probably agree with me. The library is everything that can be library. Um, and the, the question of why you don't see your faculty members in the space might be because the legacy things that you continue to do are not the things they need right now. Which goes back to, if you really had a better idea of what they're doing and where they're getting stuck, and, and do some matching up of that to what you're capabilities currently and in potentia really are, you might see that there's a ton of stuff they really need you to do. It's not necessarily going to be in a chair at a table, but there might be a ton of stuff they need you to do. In fact, I, I really believe there is. I think that there's a vast untapped 
um, potential there. Um, I think that there are a ton of things that faculty members need. Uh, uh, just in one area, I'll mention, well, I'll mention two, well, maybe three. Um, <laughs> data, um, uh, publishing, dissemination, and, and also finding uh, warranted information. Just, that's just right off the top of my head. Um, but then there might be things they need space for. So there might be uh, ways in which the library could turn out to be the right place for people to have certain kinds of meetings using technology. Because, you know, they do have their communities all over the world and they are working in very big groups. So it's, it, I, I first of all think that it's fabulous that you said, well, maybe libraries are obsolete or uh, however you worded it. Because just to be able to say that I think is a really good thing. I actually don't think it's true, but the only way to find out is to really look at what people are doing that you might not be able to see um, from, from where you are positioned right now. And, and I would agree with that. I think it, it's really important to understand your different constituencies and uh, the difference between your, your undergraduate uh, students and your professional students who um, you know, are basically in the, the classroom versus your you know, research faculty, uh, your faculty educators, your faculty who are more uh, primarily clinicians, and then the employed physicians who are really primarily clinical. And um, I think there is a you know broad range of, of needs there, and um, you really need to look at the you know the physical presence represented by that continuum. So uh, I think as you go toward people who are more primarily in the clinical environment. It is those information uh, resources that, that are really important to them. Um, but from the delivery side, it's not just the physicians, it's the other health professionals. But increasingly, we're seeing needs from uh, the quality improvement people in the health system who are really looking at um, more primary evidence uh, and really informing their practice. So, um, you know, I, I think again, in the physical, tr uh, traditional community hospital, probably the physical presence is less important. I was going to add one more comment to that, and that is that I'm a clinician and a researcher, and I can tell you that the only time I set foot in the physical library now is usually for a meeting. Um, so I don't really know what I need from the physical library, and I, and I suspect that's that may not be unique, and I think that if, if it's there, then I'll come. So just, and, and I, the, other, the, the other thing I was going to say is that there's a neutrality of the library that was touched mm -hmm. upon earlier, that it's not a medical college space, mm -hmm. it's a shared space. And if we're really interested in combining and really giving interprofessional education and collaboration on a meaningful level, there, there's, a, there's a space for you. And I wonder if that, that could evolve in that direction. Okay. Um, in all of your research and planning for various libraries that are doing reconstruction processes or new buildings, um, what implications on the technology offerings have you seen? Um, what's the kind of technology that people are wanting to put in these spaces or that the students are asking for, the faculty are asking for? Uh, one of the most, um, uh, I think, asked for components are mediascapes or places where people can bring their content, plug in and share information. So if they're in small groups and studying, they can pull things up and share that, that content. Um, the, you know, people are bringing their own devices, but beyond that, uh, the health science libraries are checking out laptops um, within the facility. They're also providing the genius bar type of um, facility. Someone asked a question a little bit about what's the changing role in the librarian in this new kind of model. One is, you know, how to deal with technology and whether you have IT people that are on your staff that, that house those uh, kind of um, points within the library or whether it's a librarian that's kind of learning that and helping with that. But those are, you know, those are places where students working on anything that have trouble with their technology can go to and, and get help. Uh, beyond that, then, there's the more advanced elements like the, um, you know, technology sandbox, which is the maker space, maybe incorporating 3D printers or, or um, 3D scanners and elements that help create content, the, 
the digital uh, media, the one button studios, um, the production of um, VR files so that you begin to uh, share that information in a way that's very immersive in, in other people's viewing of it. Um, and it's, uh, it's not, you know, it, what, as we said, um, these are things that are here today already that are just going to expand exponentially um, very rapidly. Do we have time for one more question? Um, I think Mary Ann's over here. We need two. What's that? We need to have two more questions? Oh. <laughs> just push the envelope there, right? <laughs> okay. Well, I was um, very happy to hear Dr. Barnes talk about all of the uh, growing relationships and stakeholder relationships that might um, impact the library. And um, I know in my environment at the University of Vermont, we have a whole new health network involving uh, multiple hospitals with our medical center. And we have a growing network of academic relationships where the academic program is um, uh, developing branches and new uh, centers. Um, and so all of these are making, I would say, demands upon the library without necessarily appreciating the other stakeholders. Um, and also including the um, College of Nursing and Health Sciences, say, and also the fact that uh, the library reports to the university library rather than to anybody in the academic health center. So um, I'm guessing, or I'm, I guess I'm saying that there are organizational cultural and political um, impacts that sometimes start to boil down into these plans for changing the space. And the space becomes embl emblematic of all of these other things that are hap happening, but maybe aren't really the thing. So um, I guess I'm, we're sort of at this nexus right now of trying to uh, figure out how to combine all of these interests um, in this one space um, that is uh, emerging and hopefully going to last us to the future. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, it, I think it's a really good point. And I think it, it really raises the issue that it goes beyond space planning. And it's really about strategic planning for library and information resources. And really needs to go beyond the, the library itself to you know an institutional plan for what this means within both the traditional university academic setting, but also with these evolving relationships. And the thing that we worry about is that promises are made to all these other entities that you know have that whole spectrum of relationships that are in sometimes in some cases neither desirable nor feasible in terms of the resources that we can provide. Um, uh, and I think that's why it's extremely important for there to be discussions between the, the delivery side and the, the university to, to understand. We've, we've had a really steep learning curve with the clinical delivery system to get them to understand what all of this involves, particularly the licensing issues and, you know, why it costs so much, why, you know, it can only be provided to, you know, through the network and not to the community-based physicians. and. Um, I, I think those discussions are, are critically important at this t period of time. Okay, you got your last question. Globalization of information, and many of us who are library directors know how important adjacency matters, and we have an opinion of where we want to be located or who we want to be located next to. So thinking about 10 years from now, what would be your opinion of where should the library be located or co-located or adjacent to? That's a big question. Um, <laughs> we embark on nine month studies just to solve that particular problem. <laughs> um, I think this will help address this question and the question prior, but I think it's very important that you get all of the stakeholders at the table and that it becomes an open dialogue across the campus as to where that should be. Um, for those of you that already have a library and you're looking to renovate that library, you're not really looking to move it. So it may have outgrown 
being the nexus of campus and it may now be on the perimeter and um, there's a lot of thought that has to go into whether or not that can be moved or whether it just stays right there. I'm working with two campuses right now where the hospital is at in the center. So in order for everybody to use the library, there's a lot of student traffic uh, going around the hospital because they can't take the cut throughs to get there. Um, so I think it's just really important to get all the different players at the table and start open dialogue on all of these different issues because you can't be everything to everybody and there needs to be some priority setting that occurs in that process. Does that help? All right, well that concludes a very uh, informative, exciting, enlightening panel. Thank you all for your questions and your attention and let's give them another round of applause.